Sage Mott, we are getting there, doo-doo. That is it. That was incredible. That's what I'm talking about. We are getting there. Love it. Love it. Open up your Bibles today to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1. We'll get there in just a minute. We find ourselves in a time and in a culture that is, in my opinion, unlike any other time that I've experienced in my life. We live in a society that is hopelessly divided, both um, politically and racially. On top of that, we find ourselves in a culture that's growing increasingly hostile to our Christian faith and our values. But the 21st century church is not the first time that Christians found themselves in a culture that was hostile to their faith. In the first century, a man named Jesus of Nazareth showed up on the scene, and he claimed to be God, and he ministered and taught for three years. During that time, he established a new kingdom that he claimed that he was the king of, and after that three years of teaching, he was crucified on a Roman cross, and the craziest thing happened in the history of the world, the guy rose from the dead. And the men that had followed him and his followers who were on the night of his crucifixion completely scared to death, all of a sudden after the resurrection were incredibly emboldened and took the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth at the time. And the government, who was in power at the time, did not like it. They didn't like it. These Christians refused to worship the emperor, but would only worship Jesus. These Christians refused to participate in the evil and sinful practices of the Roman culture. And because of that, the Romans, the Roman Empire viewed these Christians as a threat to their power. And so they began to persecute these Christians, these people that called themselves the church. And while the widespread intense persecution of believers would not sort of begin for a little while, the apostle Peter saw the storm clouds looming on the horizon. And he wrote a letter to the churches at the time, scattered throughout Jerusalem and then all in the known area. And he wrote them, and I want you to hear this, he wrote them to teach these Christians not how to avoid suffering, but he wrote them this letter to teach them how to endure in suffering. Did you catch that, y'all awake? He wrote them a letter not to teach them how to avoid suffering. He wrote them a letter to teach them how to endure suffering and be faithful to Jesus in the midst of a world that's going crazy. And guys, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. But it seems like to me that the storm clouds are looming on the horizon for us. And I chose to preach through this book. We're going to go verse by verse through it because that's what we need to do. It may be difficult to avoid suffering. But we need to be faithful to Jesus Christ no matter what comes. And so let's jump in together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Let's pray quickly. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for its power. I thank you for its clarity. I thank you, Lord, that years ago, you enabled and empowered Christians to walk faithfully to you no matter what. I pray that we would be that people. Lord, speak through me today. Speak, more importantly, through your word today so that we can leave here different is how we came in. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So I just read to you those first two verses of 1 Peter. And most of us, if you're studying your Bible, you're reading 1 Peter, you breeze through those two verses. You don't pay much attention to them. And that's actually a mistake, and I want to tell you why. Because what Peter just did in those first two verses was give us the secret to rejoicing in the midst of trials and suffering. That's what he did. It's in there. We breeze over it, but it's significant. He gives us the secret to rejoicing in the midst of suffering. And we know that's what he's doing because at four short verses later, he comes right out and says that's what he's doing. Look at verse 6. 1 Peter 1, 6. Peter says, In this you rejoice. In this you rejoice. 
Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Now, guys, I don't know about you, but, but I, I read that. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. I say, wait a minute, Peter. You're telling me that I'm going through a trial in my life that's so significant that I'm grieving. And that my response is that I rejoice. That sounds crazy, but that's exactly what he just said. And in these first two verses, Peter tells us, he's saying, look, here's the secret. Here's the secret to doing that. The secret to rejoicing in the middle of trials and suffering. And so in these first two verses, what Peter does, he gives us six data points, kind of six thoughts, six foundations, things we need to remember to enable us to rejoice when persecution and suffering and trial inevitably comes. We're going to walk through four today, two next week, but we'll be done after four. Here's the first one. Here's the first step, if you will, in these texts that we see to help us rejoice in the midst of suffering. Number one, if you're taking notes. Remember who's speaking to you in the book of 1 Peter. Sounds pretty uh, straightforward, but it's actually key. Peter wanted you to remember who is speaking to you. It's essential to rejoicing in suffering. Look at 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Peter begins the letter and he says, Peter, says his name. Then he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now again, that's one of those phrases you've never spent any time on in your life, in your Bible study, but it actually, that little phrase, that little title he gives himself carries some weight. It has significance. First thing he says is, he says his name, and then he says, I'm an apostle. The apostles were the 12 men that hung out with Jesus Christ, spent time with Jesus on his time during the earth, and then were specifically commissioned by Christ to take the message of the gospel to the world. And so he says, I'm that. I'm an apostle. But then he makes an interesting statement. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now that seems pretty straightforward. They would call himself an apostle of Jesus Christ, but there's weight to that. It's significant because that is the only title in the scripture that places of Jesus Christ with it. You never see... um, Someone call themselves an, a, te- a teacher of Jesus Christ. You never see anyone call themselves um, an evangelist of Jesus Christ. And yet, here Peter makes this really bold statement, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And very quickly, don't want to spend much time on this, but he is making the statement to everybody that's reading it, including us. He goes, I want you to know something. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, which means that the words that you are hearing and reading today are not my words, but they are the words that are coming out of the mouth of Jesus. There's a bold way of saying my words are not my words, Peter said, but they're the words of Jesus Christ. That's going to be huge for you to know how to rejoice in the midst of suffering. Because what Peter is going to tell us, Sage Mont, is some really difficult stuff. He's going to talk about, he's going to talk about some things that are very, very difficult to live out. We hear him, we say, amen, and then we have to go live them out out there, and it's difficult to do. He's going to teach us things like that our holiness is more important than our happiness and our comfort and our ease. He's going to teach us that when we're attacked and we're maligned and we're persecuted, that we ought to respond in love. He's going to teach us something today that's, that's pretty crazy, which is that God allows us to go through trials and suffering and hardship in order to make us look more like Jesus. And Peter knew that. Peter knew it would be difficult to look out or to live out, and he knew you, you and I just simply wouldn't do it unless we realized that the one that was asking us to do it was not Peter himself, but the risen King of kings and Lord of lords, which is Jesus Christ. And so he begins by saying, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so that's step one to you rejoicing and suffering is to know that it is not Peter, it's not me, but it's Jesus that's calling you to rejoice in suffering. Here's step number two key to rejoicing and suffering. Step number two, remember that this world is not your home. That's the second key to rejoicing, enduring, suffering, and trials, and persecution is to remember that this world is not your home. Look at 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and then he says, to those who reside as aliens. I want you to look at that phrase. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, is saying, Jesus is speaking to you. Here's who I'm writing to, to those who reside as aliens. That's an interesting thing to call them because they're Christians. 
He knows he's writing to Christians. It's clear throughout the entire letter. Why does he call them aliens? Like why, why does he call them aliens? And here's the answer. That word aliens is a word that means stranger or foreigner. He calls these Christians foreigners. Now that's interesting to me. Because a lot of the people that he's writing to were born and they were raised in the areas that were reading the letter. So why would he call these Christians, he does, and by the way, he doesn't say, uh, I'm, I'm Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to Christians in these areas. He calls them aliens. He calls them foreigners. Why would he do that? Why would he call these people that were born and raised in these areas foreigners? And the answer is because he's reminding us that this world is not our home. He's describing, hear this, he's describing a Christian's relationship to the world that we live in. That yes, you may have been born and raised in the United States, but your primary citizenship is not in the United States. You may have been born and raised in the United States, but your primary citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And that's what he's getting at here. And because of that, because of the fact that, that our primary citizenship is not in the United States, but it's the kingdom of God, you and I are foreigners here. We're passing through this place to our eternal home where we will live forever, our true home. And if you're honest, if I'm honest, most of us don't think about ourselves that way. If, if someone were to come to me and they would say, Matt, where are you from? You know, what's your home? I would say, well, I'm from Texas, dadgummit, the greatest state in the world. But Peter would say, that's wrong thinking. He would say, Texas really, at the end of the day, is not your home. You're a foreigner here. You're a stranger here. This is a temporary place where you're just passing through. And when that starts sinking in, that's key to you enduring suffering. Because when that starts sinking in, it's going to change the way you view this place. And here's what I mean when I'm talking about that. Um, you guys called me to be your senior pastor. My first Sunday was May 17th. And so we moved here, and, and I started on May 17th, but then we, Jennifer and I didn't move our family into our new permanent home for a couple of months. So we had to find a temporary place to live. And so for about two months, I lived in um, Pastor Chuck and Maureen's upstairs bedroom. And I had a temporary residence. And, because, and knowing that that was just a temporary place I was living completely changed how I interacted with their home because it was temporary. I'll tell you what I didn't do in my temporary home. I didn't come up to Maureen and say, Maureen, you know, I'm not a big fan of the color that you painted this room that I'm staying in. Could we, could we paint it a different color? You know, I didn't, I didn't um, get bored staying up there in the room because they didn't have a TV, and so I didn't go buy a TV and mount it on the wall and, and get direct TV plugged into the upstairs bedroom because they didn't have it. I didn't come to Pastor Chuck and say, Chuck, you know, man, it's, um, it's May. It's, it's peach season. Let's go, let's go buy a tree and plant a peach tree and start growing it. I didn't do that. Why? Because I was only there on a temporary basis. And that's what Peter's reminding us. He's saying, look, you're an alien here. You're a stranger here. This is your temporary home. This is how you need to view this planet. Because when you do, it's going to profoundly change you. Because all of a sudden, things are going to start happening. When you really believe that, what the Bible says, it'll change you. All of a sudden, you giving of your finances to expand the kingdom of God is not some big sacrifice, but it's an investment in your future eternal home. All of a sudden, service to the church or to, for, for the name of Christ and the building of his kingdom, all of a sudden, that's not a drudgery, but you're storing up treasure for yourself that you're going to get to enjoy forever in your eternal home. And even if you walk through suffering, and you walk through trials, and you respond in a Christ-like way, that is just one more crown that you get to lay at the feet of Jesus. Peter knew that. He knew that the secret to rejoicing in the midst of suffering is to remember that your suffering is temporary, and you will spend eternity in a home, in a place, in a time where you will never suffer ever again. So that's step number two. The secret to this, which is not easy to do, by the way, is to remember this place is not your home. Here's number three. Here's step number three in, in rejoicing and suffering. This is when it starts getting difficult for some people, so I want you to listen carefully to me. 
through this process. This is one of the most difficult theological sentences in the New Testament. Step number three, rejoicing and suffering. Remember that God is sovereign and works all things for your good. Not that sentence, but the Bible sentence is the, is the hardest one. Remember that God is sovereign and works all things for your good. Now, guys, this next part of the verse is one of the reasons that most preachers don't preach verse by verse to the Bible. Because they come to verses like that, and one, they don't take the time to understand what it means, or when they do understand what it means, it's too difficult, and they're scared to death to preach what it actually says. It's kind of a difficult statement at first glance, but the more it sinks in, the more you realize that this is going to be one of the most comforting things you ever hear in your entire life. Let's read it together, 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Peter says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. These words are the words of Jesus. To those who reside as aliens, this is not your home, you're a foreigner here. I'm writing to those scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, those are all the known areas of the world at the time. And then watch what he says. He says, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, for the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. And so he's he's saying all this stuff that we can relate to. He's like, okay, Jesus is, at the end of the day, is the author of the Bible. He's speaking to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This world is not our home. Amen and amen. And then he drops this crazy, profound statement on us. He says, hey, I want you also to know you were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. You go, what in the world does that mean? Well, it's important to note here that he's not talking about your salvation, A lot of commentaries use that statement as a proof text for Calvinism. It's actually not. He's not talking about being chosen for salvation. Listen carefully. When he says you were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, he's implying, and I'll show you what I mean here in a second, but he's implying that God chose you for the trials that you're going to face in this life. Now, that sounds crazy. Hang with me. I'll show you what I'm talking about you got to get down into the text, and so let's look at together. Um, let's look at verse uh, 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and he says, who are chosen? And so he makes the statement that you and I as believers, and these people that are hearing it that are believers, they were chosen. Now that is the Greek word electos. And without going into a whole sermon on it, which I could, that simply means that God handpicked you for something. I didn't say this. I didn't come up with that. It's literally what it says. It says, I'm writing to the people that were handpicked by God. What is God doing? What's he handpicking people for? It says, you were handpicked, you were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. So he handpicked us to the foreknowledge of God. That word foreknowledge is key to understand what's going on here. When you look at the Greek language that the New Testament was written in, that Peter's writing in, that word foreknowledge in the Greek is the Greek word prognosis. You ever heard that word before? That's literally the Greek word. If you look at it today in the Greek New Testament, it'll be prognosis. Now here's the definition of the word prognosis. Prognosis is the forecasted or the forecast of a likely outcome of a situation. It's the forecast of a likely outcome of a situation. I've heard that word before myself. When I was 31, I got diagnosed with cancer of the appendix. We had surgery. They removed the appendix. They did the biopsy on my lymph nodes and, and everything, and they came back and they said, Matt, everything looks good. We want to give you your prognosis. We, we have a forecasted outcome, the likely outcome of what's going to happen. They said, we think we got all the cancer. Your prognosis is good. We don't think you'll ever see this cancer again. That is literally what Peter is saying here. He's saying that when suffering comes into your life, you don't freak out, but you rejoice. Why? Because God chose your prognosis. That's what he said. In other words, God hand-picked you. He selected you for a forecasted outcome. And this is not the first time we see this in Scripture. Don't turn there, but Psalms 139, 16. The psalmist literally says this. In Psalms 139, 16, the psalmist says, Your eyes, God, talking to God, he said, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. 
And in your book were written, in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Guys, that's profound. Here's what the psalmist just said, that every single solitary one of your days were formed and were written down in God's book by God before you ever lived one of them. But Peter and the psalmist are talking about God's sovereignty and how he has a specific plan and a specific purpose for every single solitary day of your life. And hear this, what this is implying, what the psalmist is implying, what Peter's implying is even on the worst day of your life, God is there and he is at work and he is using it for your good. And church, that is the best news I've ever heard in my life. That's the best news I've ever heard in my life other than Jesus Christ shed his blood on a cross for my sin is that even on the worst day of my life, God has not abandoned me, but he is there and he is using it for his good, my good and his glory. That's what the scripture says. One of the other places we see this in the Bible is in Genesis 37. We see it crystal clearly in Genesis 37. It's the story of Joseph. For those of you that grew up in Sunday school, had the flannel board thing, and saw Joseph, and what, what, was, what did his coat look like? It was a coat of what? Many colors. Got some badness in here. And Joseph's dad loved him, and he made him a coat of many colors. Well, his brothers got jealous of him. Got jealous of him, and they hatched a plan to steal his coat and then sell him into slavery into Egypt. And so let me read this to you really quickly. Genesis 37, 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him in a pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bringing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his other brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Now, I want you to put yourself in Joseph's shoes for just a second. His brothers just jumped him. They stole his most prized possession They threw him into a pit where there's no water, and then they sold him into slavery in Egypt where he will go to prison and spend multiple years of his life. Would you and I agree that the brother is having a bad day? As a matter of fact, I would argue that this was hands down the single worst day of Joseph's entire life. His life is falling apart. It's bad. He's not only being persecuted, he's going through a trial. He's not only going through a trial, but he is suffering. And none of it was his fault. Now, if you're in Joseph's position, what's your temptation? I know my temptation would be, well, to think, God, you've abandoned me. I'm hanging out with my dad. He's making coats for me. Life's good. Now I'm a slave in Egypt because of my stinking brothers. God, where are you? That's what I'm thinking. Our temptation is to think that the Lord abandoned us. And I don't know about you, but I'm I'm thinking I might get a little bitter at my brothers. I'm thinking maybe that um, my heart would even begin to hate them. I, I think I might even, some of us might even begin to get bitter at God. Because he allowed this horrible evil to happen to us. But that's not how Joseph responds. He gets sold into slavery by his brothers, but he never got bitter. He never walked away from God. And because of that, Joseph began to grow in his favor with his Egyptian captors to the point that he eventually rises to be one of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt's top advisors. Years later, Joseph's brothers get captured. They get brought to Egypt. And because Joseph had risen to power as one of Pharaoh's top advisors, his brothers were brought before Joseph, and he got to decide their fate. Now, let's put our, uh, ourselves in Joseph's position again. You've got these guys in front of you that have horribly 
mistreated you and abused you. And where the, the reason behind the single worst event in your entire life, there before you, what do you do? Again, I think I would be tempted to put those guys in jail for at least a couple of days to think about what they did to me. But that's not what he does. He ends up blessing them. He blesses them. Doesn't retaliate against them. Get some release. Guys, how did he do that? Y'all, y'all heard all that, and you're like, I, I think I would have responded kind of mad how you were saying, not how Joseph was saying. How in the world does he do that? He tells us in Genesis 50, 19, watch this. Joseph tells us how he was able to do it. In Genesis 50, 19, the brothers are in front of him. Joseph speaks and says, but Joseph said to them, to his brothers, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Tells his brother, hey, don't be afraid because I want you to know that I know that I'm where I'm at because the Lord has me here. I'm in the place of God in slavery in Egypt. And then he goes on, and this is a profound verse, verse 20. He looks back at him. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You, brothers, you meant that for evil, but in that moment, the worst moment of my entire life, God meant your evil for my good. That's what Peter's saying. That's all he's saying. Peter's teaching us that when trial comes into your life, and it's coming, the secret to not falling into despair, the secret to not growing bitter, the secret to rejoicing, is to remember that even on your worst day, God takes what the world meant for evil, God takes what Satan meant for evil, God takes what your enemies meant for evil, and he destroys the power of those things by turning them and using them for your good and his glory. And again, it's the greatest news I've ever heard in my life. Now really quickly, step to step three, How do we rejoice in the midst when our life is falling apart? We remember the sovereignty of God and that he's using everything in our life for our good and his glory. Here's the last one, number four. The key to rejoicing in the midst of suffering is remember that God uses every trial to, he uses every trial in our life to transform us into something that's beautiful and powerful. That's, it's huge, it's key. For you to remember that every trial you're walking through in your life, God is at work. We just learned that. He's sovereign. He's at work. What is he doing in us in that trial that he's at work in? He's transforming us through that trial into something powerful and beautiful. Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. Look at verse 2. 1 Peter 1, 2. It says, according to the foreknowledge of God, you were chosen. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father... God chose your prognosis, and then the next thing he says, Peter tells why God chose your prognosis. He says, according to the foreknowledge, you were chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Why? For the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus. Peter said, God chose you according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He handpicked your prognosis. Why? For the sanctifying work of the Spirit that you would obey Jesus Christ. What Peter is saying here, church, listen carefully. He's saying through every moment of suffering, every moment of trial in your entire life, the Holy Spirit is at work through that trial, transforming you and sanctifying you into a person that looks like Jesus Christ. We think the greatest good in our life is to be free from suffering. We think the greatest good in our life is for us to avoid suffering. Peter's saying, no, actually, the reason you rejoice is because the greatest good in your life is when you walk through suffering and it makes you look more like Jesus. That's the greatest good. And so that some of us, we need to let that sink in today. We need to let that sink into our lives today, into our hearts today. Because what he's saying, again, he's, he's writing these people to comfort them, comfort them in the midst of suffering, but he doesn't write them to comfort them by saying they're going to be able to avoid suffering. Everybody look at me. He's comforting them by saying that every single time you suffer in this life, it has a purpose. Every moment of it has a purpose. God is at work. Let that sink in. Are you going through a trial right now? You just got through a trial. Three kinds of people. You just got through a trial. You're walking in a trial. You're about to go through a trial. 
let it sink in. God's not allowing you to go through that trial to harm you or to punish you. He's not allowing you to go through that trial because he's forgotten you. It's actually the polar opposite of that. He's allowing you to go through that trial because he loves you. He's allowing you to go through that trial not because he's left you. He's allowing you to go through the trial because his hand is upon you. He's allowing you to go through that trial not because he's forgotten you, because he is transforming you into something more beautiful and powerful than you were for the kingdom of God. And that's incredible news. We forget that. I want to tell you a quick story. I uh, sort of illustrates this years ago when I was at the Austin Stone, the pastor of the Stone, and Chris Tomlin was my worship leader. We went to the Passion Conference together. For those of you that know what the Passion Conference is, it's a conference for college students and young professionals, and Tomlin was leading worship. Louis Giglio was preaching, and a guy named John Piper was preaching there. If you don't know who John Piper is, he's going to be one of the guys that we look back on. He's like one of the top theologians of our time and generation. He's a big deal in certain circles, and he is I'm, I hope he doesn't listen to this. He, he's one of the most socially awkward people I've ever met in my life. He's very introverted. He's brilliant, but he's very introverted, and he's intense. He's just an intense dude. He's like 69 or 70 now. And we were at Passion Conference, and he came up to Chris Tomlin and said, Chris, I want to go to lunch with you here at the conference. And he didn't say why he wanted to go to lunch. And so a few minutes after that, Tomlin comes running up to me. He goes, Matt, John Piper just asked me to lunch. And I was like, why? He said, I don't know, but I think maybe I wrote a song that was theologically incorrect, and he's about to lay me out. So would you, he's like, would you go with me to lunch in case it gets theological? You got my back? And I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm like second year the, you know, seminary student, bro. I, I, and he's like, you got to go. So I said, okay. And so we went to lunch together, and it was one of the most awkward lunches of my entire life. Because Tomlin is this, if you've ever watched him, he's so charismatic on stage and so amazing in person. He's pretty introverted, and Piper's worse than him. And I'm pretty introverted too. So it's, we're sitting there. Jennifer is with me. Uh, Jesse Reeves, who wrote How Great Is Our God, was with Tomlin. And Jennifer and Jesse are extroverts. And so they're uncomfortable with how awkward the whole thing is. And so Jesse feels like he needs to talk. Chris is bass player to like liven things up and get the conversation going because we're literally true story. We're just sitting there eating, nobody saying a word. Jesse starts telling the story that vaguely had something to do with Dr. Piper and, and it kind of culminated in this big punchline that was really funny and, and I'm laughing and Tomlin's laughing and Jennifer's laughing and Piper doesn't laugh. <laughs> Piper looks at Jesse, true story, looks at Jesse and says, riveting. <laughs> Jennifer's under the table now at this point. Finally, mercifully, John Piper begins to sort of speak and never talks to Tomlin the entire time, by the way. And I had just gone through cancer. Dr. Piper was going through cancer at the time. Nobody knew it. He looks at me and he said, Matt, I heard you were walking through cancer. He said, tell me what you learned. I said, well, Dr. Piper, I said, honestly, it's a, it's a really long story. But I said, I'll just simply say this. I said, in many ways, cancer is one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. Because through it, God drew me to Jesus Christ in a way I don't think I ever would have without walking through cancer. That's all I said. And as soon as I said it, John Piper smiled for the first time in the whole lunch. This big smile got on his face, and he leans in real close to me. And he says, Suffering is a beautiful hermeneutic. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> True story. Grab my phone under the table. I'm texting pastor at the, one of the pastors of the stone. I'm like, suffering is a beautiful hermeneutic. What does this mean? Quick, 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 quick. Tell me. And he texts back. He says, Matt, that means that suffering makes the Bible come alive. That suffering brings God into this sharp clarity that you don't ever see when everything is good. 
The greatest moments of spiritual growth in my life, church, did not happen in the good times, but the greatest moments of spiritual growth in my life, they happened when my life was falling apart, because when my life was falling apart, God gave me something that was so much better than ease and comfort and safety. He gave me more of himself. And that's what Peter is saying. Be comforted. Rejoice. You can rejoice in suffering because you remember who's speaking to you. It's not Peter, it's Jesus. You can rejoice in suffering because you can remember this world is not your home. You can rejoice in suffering because you remember that God is sovereign and that he's working every moment of your life. And lastly, you can rejoice in suffering because you remember that God is transforming you into something beautiful and powerful. And I'll end today. I'm done. Don't move. Hear this. I'm done with this. In light of everything we've learned today, in light of everything we're going to see, Peter is screaming from the rooftops this truth, this reality. That if you're here today and you're not a believer, enjoy this life. Soak up all this life that you can. Live for every moment. Gather up as much stuff as you can. Experience everything that this life has to offer. Because if Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior, this life is as close to heaven as you're ever going to get. But... If you are a believer, if you've trusted in Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, if you're his child, if you're his son, or you're his daughter, endure suffering. Endure it when it comes. Endure the trials and the tribulations and the mockery and the scorn and the persecution. If you're his child, you can rejoice in suffering. You can stand tall and smile at the looming storm clouds that are coming because if you are his child, this world is as close to hell as you are ever going to get. And that's why we rejoice. So let's pray. Father, I pray for those that have recently walked through trials. I pray for those that right now, as I speak, are in one. And I pray for those that soon will be. I pray that they would remember and they would stand fast with the reality that none of this takes you by surprise. That you're still on your throne. That you're alive. That you never sleep. You never slumber. And that you're good. And that we can trust you with every moment of our lives. Father, this world needs a lot of things, but one thing it needs are people that trust you no matter what. Help us be those people, no matter what we face in the days to come. Let's shine like stars in the sky. Father God, we love you. We praise you. God, we pray that you would do this great work in us. And as we sing to you today, I pray it would be more than a song, more than the words on a screen but it would be our confession and our prayer that all my life you've been faithful, that all my life you've been so, so good. And so with every breath that I'm able, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. We ask all these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand together.